So hi and welcome to another episode of the Foss North podcast. Uh, today we have George with us um, and we found a blog from him regarding uh, dual licensing. Uh, and uh, yeah, we, we want to talk about it. So who are you and, and why are you interested in this, George? So um, currently, well, I'm a guy that writes stuff on the internet and writes code, but, but currently the, the thing that makes me a bit interested in the topic is the fact that for the last year and a half, I've been working by currently one of the engineering leads on an open source project that is, well, has been for the last almost year, I guess, licensed under uh, GPL and is a commercial endeavor in that um, we can license it um, under proprietary licenses to various companies uh, that want to use it in you know products where uh, they don't necessarily want to be subject to the GPL and we can add features to it without releasing the, the public because again, we are adding those to a proprietary licensed versions where we don't have to, to merge the changes into, into upstream, so to speak. Um, so that's kind of the, the interest that got me in there, but also the fact that I just see it as a very nice business model in general and it, it i was quite surprised actually when this happened like i think two years ago when people were kind of mad that redis was switching towards this model right of basically copy left for me but not for d kind of style after aws refused to pay the money and, and i was surprised at like how, how negative the sentiment was so i really wanted to just give a bit of thoughts like you know okay let me think is this actually any bad and honestly i can't find much reason why it is so that was kind of my motivation to some extent. I mean, the, the challenge, I think, from a... F let's dive in with the AWS here. So the, the challenge there, I think, was that they uh, they didn't preserve the open source nature of the license, I think, because they do, it was targeted. Uh, you you broke one of the, the basic freedoms that you can't, can't use it for all purposes or something like that. Uh, I mean, the other way to do uh, dual licensing is to have a very, very strong and, and open copyleft that sort of prevents proprietary endeavors around it, like yeah, the, so, so Vero, you can, GPL, or... Yep. Exactly. You can use it for all purposes, but if there is any money involved, like, you know, free or, you know, any proprietary software involved, like, anywhere near it, then it's illegal suddenly. Um, so, yeah, exactly. But, How does but, it work with the GPL in, in this way? Because... This is a freedom you are taking from the user of it, isn't it? I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I guess the uh, what, what AWS did was uh, since it's as a service, it doesn't trigger the distribution. So that that's oh, yeah. the interesting part. Okay. Yeah, so and that's... Redis was kind of uh, not under a AGPL type license, so. It it never triggered, yeah. Okay, but but George, how how do you handle the logistics around this? Because I, I guess you need to be the copyright owner to be able to do a license. Uh, do do you use like contribution agreements or or how do you ensure that you can relicense the code? Yeah, so this gets in, into the part where I will want to mention, like generally speaking, if I say something about the projects I work on, there is actually like a part time, I think lawyer which kind of handles things so i don't do this happily enough but to, to, to my understanding <laughs> what we actually do is for example for contributions for small contributions uh we simply have like a content license agreement as you said and for stuff like you know people want to contribute to github you don't want to bother people a lot of a pr you can basically automate all that stuff in that you can just send people a link and tell them like hey can you please sign this here or it's even something like written consent like i agree with the license just type that as a comment and then you know i don't even have to look for the comment i just know that the the cla bot is telling me like everything is fine so i think in, from that perspective it's easy and easy enough to automate and a lot of companies do it via the cla so like canonical i believe that this most apache foundation projects work that way where apache actually reserves the right to all the code via cla i think ours actually we inspired it from the apache foundation um, but I guess the, you know, the issue, uh, starts being, you know, when you have people that are bringing in potentially major contributions, right? Like if someone spent like a month on a, on a patch, uh, 
you know, maybe at some point you're like, well, maybe it's unethical to just, you know, take this code away, right? Maybe the person doesn't want to sign a, a CLA for it, right? How do you handle uh, dependencies? Uh, it, because if you, I don't know about the software which you're uh, using, but I guess it uses some libraries, some GTPL uh, libraries. And then when you would relicense it under commercial license, all those uh, GPL libraries would still trigger the GPL, wouldn't they? So this is, see, this is the point where um, I am not a lawyer comes into play. Because I, okay. <laughs> I actually did a bit of reading into this and I'm quite confused about a few things. So, for example, you have something like uh, lib, uh, libc that's used by GCC, right? And that's under GPL in theory. And that's like linked in a lot of places. And you have Google, for example, I think. Like they literally have their own libc. They reload, you know, or, or Apple or people that use Clang. They have like the MIT Lance license. However, Clang calls their libc, right? Mm -hmm. But, but, GNU libc is, is GPL and people link it in a lot of projects and like nobody has gotten sued for using it. At the same time, I think our stance at the moment, and, and this is kind of lucky just because of the environment we're in, is we don't really have GPL dependencies um, in that, you know, we, well, there's a, there's a quick script that I, I use to basically look like, okay, is there any GPL dependency? And in principle, the idea is, okay, don't have GPL dependencies. Um, I guess that's, you know, that was the recommendation. That that being said, like, again, this is something quite confusing and I haven't found anyone to like solve the confusion. And this is kind of where GPL breaks down because arguably, right, um, almost any software that you <coughs> compile on like half the machines in the world, it's in some way has something from like libc linked to it or will run in an environment with, with libc um, or, you know, some code from libc might have been inlined into it for some optimization. Like, well, I guess if it's just Python code, that's fine. But like, if you compile it with Cyton, for example, then suddenly you've statically linked uh, a GPL license thing. And but if we're talking about the yeah. GNU libc, that is, uh, yeah, yeah. that is under the LGPL. So then linking ah. doesn't trigger it. Ah, okay. So I, I didn't actually know that. I didn't know that. So LGPL would not be triggered by linking. Yeah. Not dynamically, at least. Well, no, but it's... but statically, would it not be triggered statically? Because I'm thinking like static linking. It, ooh, I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> yeah, that, no, that, that, no, that's what I said. Really, what I was. You know, it doesn't matter if it's linking or dynamic. Uh, sorry, static or, or dynamic. Okay. Okay. And uh, the the same thing would apply to to using the kernel, like uh, assuming that you're using the Linux kernel. So. Linux is, is released on the GPL version 2 and, and version 2 only, but everybody can link to that without a problem. And that's because of But I think exception. the kernel has an explicit exception. Yeah, they it? do. So what, it's what an exception there. So that the, the uh, sort of the, the user land uh, link interface does not trigger the GPL. So anyone can run their own libc in the user land, and that doesn't consider it to be linking to the kernel. But they explicitly say that, that we use GPL, and in this case, you do not trigger the GPL, just so that you can build a proprietary user land on top of the, the open source kernel, so to speak. And I, I don't know where this started. This uh, depends on static or dynamic linking, but the, the lawyers I've spoken to, and s some of them are respectable, <laughs> the, uh, all of them say that it doesn't matter. So I, I trust them fully. Yeah. That's good. Yeah, we're not lawyers either, but Henrik has some lawyer acquaintances. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps I'm a lawyer wannabe. No. <laughs> but there's another aspect to, to dual licensing that's kind of interesting. So so I'm an Avid Qt user, and they, they also use the dual licensing. And the way that they ensure... So, so they sell developer seats. Uh, so if we were in a team they prevent the rest of the team from having from using the GPL version and me just using the license to compile the actual release mm -hmm. by having a quite complicated and, and strong end user license agreement for the commercial customers. Do, do you have similar problems or, or how, how how do you ensure that your paying customers keep on paying? So I, I think in my case, like uh, in the case of MySDB, the thing that I work on, um, this is not a perfect example because our main idea is 
if you're an enterprise institution with a lot of customers, then we want money. If you are like two guys in a team that work on a project that happens to use it, whatever, right? Um, at least for now, I think that's the, the stance. Uh, and usually with enterprise customers, the idea is that they want the extra features anyway. And, and I think that's, so I think that's actually um, a lot of the maybe reason why people would want to do a license. It's, it's not so much the idea that uh, you want people to pay you when they use it in something commercial, right? Like uh, in, in our case, again, I'm not a lawyer, but I think that we don't have something like AGPL, something similar. So you could use it behind the, the, the scenes and be fine. It'd be like legal, um, even if it's the, the open source version, even if it's in a proprietary product. But again, not a lawyer, not the official word of the company. <laughs> um, but the m more the idea, I think, is more so uh, that um, if you can do a license, the thing, uh, that means that you can add proprietary features yourself without issues, right? So you can um, you can make an abstraction of the license because it's your thing, and you can have a version. Um, you might you know you might even <coughs> release uh, the actual code uh, of the of the enterprise version um, under something that's well. I guess you couldn't because the whole idea would be you don't want the code of the enterprise version to be distributed to everyone. So you have to kind of release it under something that at least says like, hey, you can't give this to everyone. So I think that's the basic idea. And, and then the issue arises with like, okay, you have to kind of modify the same code base. You have to kind of use the same code base. So I think that's one of the main drivers. Um, but again, maybe I'm wrong here and there is a way to do it uh, with even if you just have a single GPL, though I don't think so. And I think the other driver is just the fact that since you are starting with a GPL, it's easier to move into something like a GPL if you get into a position where, um, you know, actually you have a quite a good product, but cloud providers have decided they just want to kind of, well, not steal it, but, you know, use it as a service and try to, instead of paying, you kind of go around the license, as is the case with a lot of databases and AWS, GCP, etc. Unless they use, uh, unless they just pick the latest version that was uh, that was pre AGPL, and then they they side yeah, and then they it. they patch it but themselves. That you can never protect against, really. No, but but at that point, it's like you know, do you would they actually prefer to to you know develop the database? And so like probably not. Probably they prefer to just pay a much smaller amount to the original team that actually knows you know. The product but then, right. then the then the business model to keep keep customers paying is basically that you provide uh, these proprietary features and kind of support and uh, and continuous development. Yeah, to to some I mean to some extent it can even be I think you know if if your customers are mostly people that would use it on a server it can be like you know you you have a product that's AGPL again this is more the case with like databases and then. I guess you can even just provide like, hey, here's a proprietary license, you can use it as you wish, and then maybe like prioritize bugs and some support, but like you want to, you know, like you want to, to support users and to debug things anyway. So it's not like, yeah, you know, because the company is doing much. I'm just thinking that uh, for that uh, use case, you don't need to have do a licensing. You still can, they can still take uh, the GPL version and they still can pay you uh, for fixing bugs, prioritizing, and so on and so on. So there, there would be. I, I think I would make a difference there. Uh, but I suppose it's more about when when you sell it to an enterprise that doesn't want that does want to use it for for as part of another application which they consider to be well okay, unsuitable yeah. for release. Yeah, but I guess you also sell them like a service level agreement and so on. It, it comes in a bigger package. I would assume. So the the dual license would be then more, so to get rid of the GPL, uh, to to not need to uh, trigger the GPL when they release their own uh, 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 stuff, basically. Yeah. Mm. But just a, a question around what what you do. do. Do you feel that it works? Uh, do 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 you get paying customers, or or do you feel that that some customers use the open source version? And also, do do you get this open source community and sort of the benefits of of many eyes and many hands? So um, I don't want to like disclose 
internal sort of like no, 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 customer it's, uh, stuff it's, like that. It's okay not to. Answer. Um, I, I think <laughs> I think it's better to look at. I think like honestly, I think here it might be better to look at projects that are a bit more uh, mature. So I think um, well. QT might be a good example, but probably not the best. Um, I think something like uh, MariaDB, which I want to say uses the same model, but I'm not 100% sure. Um, so let me actually check. Um, Ninja I Googling. <laughs> yes, I, I, uh, I'm, you know, I don't, I don't want to misrepresent them. So yes, uh, they, they use like the LGPL license. Um, so like, I feel like for those projects, it's not an issue really and you know mariadb like does have the non-profit foundation but that there's like a for-profit branch of it um so you know i don't like personally as like a potential contributor i don't really see a case where like the fact that some you know some software is being dual licensed is like affecting my will to contribute like again there is this idea of if it's a very large patch, then I feel like, okay, I don't want to give my work and then someone else benefits. I don't have the same benefits, but like, how often do you have those users that come in with like a huge patch? And at that point, if they do that, like, wouldn't you actually want to like pay them or hire them? Right? Like if someone came to me with like, oh, here's like three months of work that like is totally, you know, awesome and, and add some features that you guys couldn't do. Like, it's not like I wouldn't try to like hire that person. Um, it, it, it might still be an issue for like some contributors, I guess, the ones that want to do it purely for like idealistic reasons, like let's move as fast as we can towards a world where everything is, is open source. I'm honestly not sure how many of those people do actually exist though. So no, and as you, as you state, I mean, the, uh, one of the benefits of, of for a commercial enterprise to work with open source component is the hiring. I mean, it's really hard to find good engineers and it, that's probably the best way to sort of know that you get the right people, especially if they've already contributed. Absolutely. And and just the fact that you can like, like again, in, in our case, because we are a smaller company, we don't have like enough, let's say, well, we have a lot of contributors, but not a lot of large ones. So usually when we hire people, we still, we actually put out an issue that's like, you know, solve this for hire, so to speak. We actually pay the people that solve it. So like, you know, if you talk with us beforehand and we agree, we give you like whatever, a fair consulting amount per hour to actually solve the thing. Um, but that's really hard to do, I think, in the proprietary company. Like, you know, either you can send like a toy problem or you can send like, uh, well, are you going to send like a large chunk of your code base? Even if you say like, well, it doesn't matter. Someone from HR will, or from, sorry, like legal will have an issue, right? So, um, you know, that's actually, I think a fairly good advantage. Like, yes, you can pick from contributors, but even if you don't have like super active contributors, even before that stage, you can actually, you know, pay people to work on the thing, um, before sort of like hiring them and, and you know, kind of have them fix yeah. just very small issues, which, which in a large company just wouldn't work because again, you would have to sign a lot of paperwork before you can do that. You would have to give them access to your internal system because not everything is on, is on GitHub. I, it's granted, it's I'm more like, more like a people. bounty type system then. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like a, a bounty type system. Again, the way we do it is like, you know, you have to talk with us before doing it because we don't want to guarantee that we'll pay you you know <laughs> before yeah. we know you but <laughs> yeah but but what you've been saying about uh, you as a, a contributor you wouldn't have a problem and so on uh, i'm thinking that in theory the this problem arises mostly of the the cla not the dual licensing perhaps both but one part is the cla which you need to sign where you give away your rights to your code which in theory you you do, you wouldn't want to do it as a company, but in theory you could have uh, make it so that that you don't have a CLA and everybody who contributes uh, still keeps the rights. And if you in if you want to sell it, you always ask them: Is it okay? Is it okay? So uh, just again, those two parts uh, uh, are, are different, I think. Uh, I mean, but uh, just a second. Uh, 
and I think in this one, I, I've been talking about this one uh, video with uh, Richard so Stallman, where he was trying to explain that uh, it's better to have dual licensing, uh, the software as dual licensed, than just proprietary. And for that reason, uh, he was basically for that uh, to to be able to to still keep the the software uh, open uh, and free instead of uh, the need to close it because of all the all the other things uh, to be able to sell it. Uh, yeah. We we, dis we discussed the contributor agreements in in, in a different uh, pod episode a while ago, and which gave a kind of broader view on what it what it might be. I mean, uh, the contributor agreement could have could just be that you uh, give away the right to relicense and nothing else. That could be enough in some cases, I guess. And you know, it, depending on how broad you make it, that. <laughs> that could affect the uh, sort of acceptance from the developer community, I guess. That's true, yeah. So do are you using some sort of template CLA or, or have you developed your own? I believe so. The one that, that um, I kind of liked and I think that's used as a template for ours. Uh, sadly enough, I must admit, I actually never took the time to read ours entirely I read the important points, but it's basically Apache license, uh, Apache CLA inspired. Um, okay, yeah. with, I think a few changes, but again, not, not a lawyer. I think the main problem with, with CLAs and, and I mean, I think to, to some extent with all these kind of like licensing legal documents is the fact that, um, they are too wordy and part of me even thinks like, why is that relevant anymore? Because like, it's not like this is going to be judged in a U.S. court, right? Like if people, like if there is a company that you actually have to sue because of license issues higher chances are that you want to do that in an international court i'm not sure you know how much this language is even valid there so you know i think the one thing you could do there is is probably try to tone down on the language because like at the end of the day you know i, I think that the restrictive language at least to some extent is meant to like catch a hundred percent of the people that could be doing something wrong but you might as well just catch 99 and that that should be fine and uh, people could actually read the cla like it would be like 10 lines like hey you give us the right to relicense and you don't have the right to relicense period yeah. then you know that's a, that's a very nice succinct cla um but <laughs> <laughs> Actually, um, I'm writing a book about about QML together with a, an ex colleague, and and we we have a CLA because we want to be able to print it. But the CLA says that all your patches are permissively licensed. I think it's BSD or something. So basically, we tell them that we will give you attribution, but we will then relicense your work towards the printer, um, which I like because the 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 BSD license is is very few lines. So I mean, it's it's easy to read. And it's an established thing and we just point at it and say that this is if you give us a patch these are the terms that you you have to sort of so, so in this case patch is like for a book like for actual text not for code right or well text or an, an example code in the book oh basically. it's, it's but, uh, but all a book the with code okay i get it yeah exactly but the but the example code is is already permissively licensed because we want people to be able to build whatever based on the licenses and not or, or on the example code and not have to retype it we just want to be able to go to a publishing house and say that we have the rights to actually print this for you um What's the book uh, about, by the way? Out of curiosity, I know QML. So, so cute markup language. So, so if ah, you go QML. to qmlbook.org, you actually find it there. So, it's all available openly, and and all the material is on GitHub. And all we want to be able to do is is to keep the door open to put it to paper. Uh, we haven't invested the time needed to do that yet, but but still, we don't want to close that door if it if somebody shows up and wants to print it. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Johan, this is your second book on uh, Qt, at least. Yep. How did you handle it uh, the, in the first book? The first one was basically a press looking for uh, for contributors. So, so that was written for them under their 
I mean, I licensed okay. them Completely sort of unlimited license. Of, I think I'm still the copyright holder, but they have all the rights for like distribution. I see. Um, okay. Yeah. They also made me write it in a word <laughs> that I hated <clears throat> for a year. So <laughs> now it's marked down. <laughs> Finally. <laughs> Couldn't you just have used Markdown and then just pan docked it over to Word? I mean, the problem was the reviewing, I can tell you, because then someone did all the little changes and you had to sit and click approve, 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 approve. And I'm not a native speaker. So they had a, a, a nice American woman who just went through the whole book and fixed all my grammar. And of course, I approve all her changes. It's uh, the biggest pain was actually that I spelled color with OU throughout oh. all examples and example screenshots. So I had to redo like half of the screenshots and a lot of example <laughs> code because she wanted the American spelling of color. So it's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you live and you learn. <laughs> all right. So moving back to the dual license thing, I have a, uh, a, a, a question uh, to you, uh, George, that um, I mean, the idea is that most enterprise users, they don't want to release the the resulting product that uh, they, w in which they use your your library, do you have a feeling for whether or not that, whether or not it's motivated that they don't want it, or if it's just like oh GPL is dangerous, uh, is, is it is it based on uh, an actual business case, or is it is it more like fear, uncertainty, and doubt? I, I feel like you know, in principle, with all enterprises i've seen not just in this case like it's mainly based on like i don't want legal liability right like I, you know after a point at least the way i understand kind of large businesses um liability becomes a very very large issue right so you are going to spend a relatively large amount of money to get a bit more assurance right like that's in part why large companies pay quite a lot for support that's you know better but not like worth thousands of dollars better, um, or at least not in the eye of like a common user, but in the eye of a company where like a one hour delay could cost them like a lot of money it is. And I think it's the same with liability, right? Because you've like in a large company, liability can mean a lot, right? Like if, you know, depending on how it can be argued that, or like in what revenue streams it can be argued that you used whatever thing that is, right? Like, it, you know, even a small liability risk, like a 0.01% added, if it's a revenue stream of like 10 billions, well, that's like 10 millions that you are saving uh, by not having that piece of legislation, which you are not like 100% sure of in there, right? So I think that's in part the motivation in a lot of cases where businesses don't want to use GPL. I mean, you know, that being said, allegedly there's, you know, like testimonies, um, that you know, companies like Goldman Sachs have stolen GPL code and used it in ways that are one hundred percent like not allowed by the license, and nothing has happened to them. And the you know, some of the persons yeah. that have reported that have been like arrested and are being held indefinitely on various charges of things. So it's you know, it's not like any business you know will be afraid of this, but I think in in general that seems to be the trend. Like. Why do it when you can just pay a small amount and not do it, or where you can? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's more like if we can keep it secret, so then we do it. Yeah. Or there, there's a risk hard. we won't be able to keep it secret, so then, then yeah. you yeah. know. <laughs> yeah, let's close the door. <laughs> okay. Yeah. But in, in in general, you the open source license that you have is GPL, or was it a Ferro GPL, or where? Uh, a, a strong copyleft one. So, the one we have, to, I actually don't want to make a definitive claim about this because, again, I am probably more aware about licensing issue with other things than with my own thing. But it's basically GPL free, right? Like it's yep. it's GPL free, but uh, I am not a lawyer, right? Like it's it is a version of the new general public license. Um, yep. So I don't I don't want to specifically say like oh this is the the thing because yeah no no I'm, I'm unsure. <laughs> um, um, but have you um, have did you do an evaluation around different licenses? I mean, I, I guess from having a permissive license would prevent the the dual license 
model because then anyone else can also do a light. Yeah, exactly. You need to go in that direction. But have you? Um, do you know what ranges of licenses you investigated? So uh, actually, I think I don't take credit, but I think like one year and something ago, I, I prompted the quest for licenses uh, to some extent, at least. Um, memory serves but essentially like we were mit at the time i believe and um the decision was made to switch to gpl3 again caveat maybe there is a difference from gpl3 but it's should be basically just gpl3 like without the a or the l um i think the range that was investigated was basically around like GPL licenses, there wasn't really a question of should we go semi proprietary? So like there was never a question of of free as opposed to open, right? Like have it be free, but not open. I, I think that's the one interesting area where you can go to like, I think for for some software, it's okay for it to probably be free, but not open, right? Um, as in like, if it's just a high quality piece of software, but it being open is not that relevant so think i don't know um something like sublime text editor right i'm not sure if yeah. that's open source or not but i'd be no it's not. kind of fine with that being closed source right um but then with, with something like let's say a machine learning library or a um encryption library right uh, obviously there like even if it's not free you definitely want it to be open right like you definitely want to see to be able to poke around inside um because you know Otherwise, um, you're not like you're not going to be able to use it for the kind of high stake problem that you actually would want to use it for, I guess, um, because you don't have a lot of certainty in what it's doing. <laughs> yeah, and it's it's very expensive to debug if you don't if you just have a binary release to work against when oh, it's something yeah. that's so highly integrated. But yeah. but may, maybe this is just me being idealistic. But I'm sort of opposed to the idea that I would be fine with using Sublime just because it's free, as in beer. Uh, because oh, for the same reason, which why I'm not comfortable with using Microsoft Windows, there is there is no way I can know what the program is doing uh, while I'm using it and while I'm not using it. So it it makes me une it makes me uncomfortable not knowing. I mean, I don't check the uh, source code for Vim every time I use it either. But but I trust that enough people have. Yeah, there there's some insane person that has hopefully checked <laughs> yeah, I mean, that it it doesn't send all my computer strokes to some uh, server and so on. But but for for Windows or for other proprietary software, yeah. There's a mix in VS Code, where, where VS Code is free software, but basically like half of the extensions are not, and they are just downloaded from the internet. You don't really know that you are doing it because you're just installing some extension, and that's downloaded, and it's proprietary, and then it's a binary which does something, and uh, which is an interesting mix of both worlds, basically. But then again, like there is the famous example of the of the JavaScript library, like I think color login library, right? That uh, could have stolen credit card info, but didn't because the guy was nice, right? But like just mm. as a showcase, like here's how I can get this into like, you know, thousands. I'm not, I'm not sure. Do you guys know what I'm talking about? I get it that he has a nice hook to, to sort of extract yeah, whatever yeah, yeah. he likes. Yeah, exactly. So let, uh, let, let's let write the regex for and catch all the. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to search sure. for the article. Do you have like show notes for the podcast? Yeah, of course we have show notes. So, so, so. we'll drop links there, and we also yeah. want links for your like uh, recruitment jobs and stuff like that. So yeah, we'll, we'll add those definitely. Um, yeah, but I think Tobias is more talking about like a moral standpoint, not uh, what what can you do, just oh, what okay. am I comfortable with, basically. Well, but I, I mean, the, the... I agree with him in that case. Like, I, I only use open source, basically. I don't think I have a single proprietary thing on my machine other than maybe projects that I'm working on. So, you know, and I'm Zoom. trying to, to be the best DevOps <laughs> advocate. Zoom, exactly. <laughs> That's one. Uh, but it's actually installed on this computer for this specific podcast because I oh. wanted to have a good microphone. Um, okay. <laughs> and usually, usually I will only use it from the proprietary device, which which sort of yeah, I've, yeah. I've kind of 
you know, I gave up. I I had like a moral yeah, yeah. line, like I I can't yeah, yeah. do the phone. I, I mean, <laughs> I, I've done the same thing. I also have an Android phone, so it's it's sort of. But yeah, but isn't the thing that over. the difference between your arguments that I mean, when it comes to Sublime or something that you as an end user use, it, you only use it for your own needs. So then it's really up to you. It, how, how strongly you feel about like the freedoms of, of the user and if it's important while if you use something like an um, what was the example an ai machine learning library or something like that you actually build a product on it and that you give to someone else so you sort of give give something in your name and you trust your supplier then or, or sort of the the upstream package and there it's much more important that you can sort of know what you give to someone else yeah, and I think it's yeah, like it's good. about. Yeah, actually, that's a good point. I was thinking more about magnitude, but yeah, like yes, it, it also matters kind of how many. Well, I, I guess with Sublime, you could argue something like Sublime introduces malicious code that adds like whatever SQL injections into like the files that people save into it, but it's more far fetched. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, and you could you, and you could find out. By just looking at your own code, <laughs> but yeah. like with encryption libraries, there's plenty of examples of like our random number generation actually generates the same number every single time. Someone caught onto that and he did not tell us that was a that's problem. That's a problem. That's Maybe a they problem used a random once. number. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a problem with random numbers. Even if it's the same number every time, you don't, you never know if it's random or not. <laughs> Well, it's it's a, it's a question of actually one one interesting thing if you want to look at it from machine learning perspective. This is just completely unrelated, but I like this sort of factor. Um, <laughs> take like any sort of like scikit learn model, like multi layer perceptron gradient booster, whatever, and generate like a sample of uh, random numbers, like from I don't know NumPy random or Mathlot random. And like, just try to have it predict the next random number based on the previous, whatever, 10 values. Uh, and actually it gets like much better than random. Like, like the, the simplicity of the machine learning model that's, that's required to actually perfectly learn a random number or not perfectly, but to like fairly well learn a num num random number generator is like surprisingly tiny. Like I, I would have thought like it would have been a hard problem. Apparently not for a lot of those out there. Um, but is it because we only have pseudo random numbers and uh, we are not using uh, some physics uh, stuff to to create those numbers? I don't know. Presumably, yeah, I mean, a pseudo, so. pseudo number generator is is you know math based. Uh, uh, an actual random number generator would would not be random in the mathematical sense. It would be arbitrary. I suppose one of those you could not predict. Yeah, exactly. Like like the problem is that. Basically, when people say random, they kind of mean two things. Like they want, I want this to be arbitrary, but also over not such a big number of samples. I want it to be like uniformly distributed. And I yeah. don't think you have something <laughs> that like in nature, you have uniformly distributed or arbitrary. I'm not sure you have yeah, like both uniformly distributed and arbitrary, but you know, I'm mm. not a physicist, so maybe you do somewhere. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I used to it's remember the pictures curve. of lava lamps. <laughs> 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 maybe it's a new thing we'll have to add. Instead of saying I'm not a lawyer, we'll have to add as well I'm not a physicist. <laughs> we'll talk about these and we need to say that we need to bring a physicist onto the show to clarify this. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and, cool. But we're we're ever so slowly running out of time. Um, it, it's been really nice talking to you. But do you feel there is something more you want to add around the licensing topic? Uh, no, I, I feel like we've we've exhausted the, the subject quite quite well, considering I know nothing about it. It's surprising how much <laughs> we've talked about it. <laughs> well, we're five five engineers trying to do a lawyer's job, so. <laughs> <laughs> Really great having you having you on the show. So thanks a lot for joining us. All right, and thank you guys for having me. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Bye bye.